Hey everyone, it's Mr. Hefner again. And today we are moving into the modern era. Yeah, it's not gonna seem like modern to you because it starts at 1900, uh, over a century ago, and it's gonna come all the way up to 1945. But at the time, art and literature took some new directions and uh, they often came under the uh, uh, kind of the moniker of modernism. Uh, for instance, I'm standing in front of an Art Deco design here. This was an example uh, in, in printed kind of media of, of what modernism was. So it's, it's a movement. It doesn't mean it's, it's contemporary with us today when we say modern, but uh, we'll have to come up with another term for it at some point. But it, anyway, it's called the modern era. It starts with 1900. It's going to go to 1945. And I think you're going to find in this unit uh, that this is... Uh, a challenging unit in a way because there's so much change that goes on in that uh, less than a half a century time period. And so we're gonna see different types of literature, different, different movements come along. Uh, we're gonna have different philosophies of, of what writing and art and literature are supposed to be. Should it just be entertainment? Should it be much more? Uh, and we're gonna start to see some politics tied in uh, with the literature of the time as well. So it's a lot to do. And, and as part of this final unit, we'll be, we'll be doing some short stories as always, we'll be doing some poetry as always, but you're also going to be reading our novel during this time. And that's gonna be The Great Gatsby, which is set in 1925. So it comes right in the middle of that whole period that we're gonna be working with. So let's get started. All right, here we are. And again, this is unit seven in the textbook. It's unit six for us, and it's going to be the last one. And it runs, as I said, right down here from 1900 to 1945. Our unit essential question for this unit is going to be what literary styles and techniques represent the modern era and the literary, art, literary artists who epitomize or are the best example of that time period. So this, this question is very much like the questions we've had for the other units. We're just gonna look at the history of this time period, what was going on in American history and what the writers of this time were saying and how the two interact and what kind of common elements and, and techniques we can find. As always, we'll take a look at what was going on in the world through some uh, quick timelines. Up at the uh, upper part, above the timeline, it's always going to be literary events, things that were uh, printed and published at that time, and down below, things that are going on in the United States and sometimes the world during that time. So uh, we start back at 1900, right at the turn of that century. So we're gonna pick up right where our Frontiers unit left off. And in the Frontiers unit, we talked a little bit uh, about Jack London, who was a, uh, an American realist writer. He believed in naturalism, the idea that human beings aren't always in control of what happens in their lives. And he was kind of early uh, for other writers in that time period. But if you see 1902, Jack London is still writing at that time. Uh, he, he writes the short story to build a fire. You might remember, you probably read that short story when you were in ninth grade here at Conrad Weiser High School. Uh, and in 1903, he writes Call of the Wild, which is a, a fairly short novel uh, with some similar themes again about uh, people trying to live in a, a hostile frozen world and their uh, relationship with animals that have only their instincts, even though instincts are sometimes better than intellect. So it seems uh, going on in the world at that time, 1901, a presidential assassination. That is the third, McKinley uh, becomes the third United States president to be assassinated uh, in about 50 years. The first obviously was Lincoln and then uh, Lincoln uh, was followed up by uh, James Garfield, uh, who was assassinated, and then McKinley. And with McKinley's death, President Roosevelt, this is Theodore Roosevelt, uh, becomes the youngest, uh, the youngest president ever. He wasn't the youngest elected president, uh, but he was the youngest president uh, at that point. Uh, somebody actually tried to assassinate Roosevelt at one point. He was giving a speech and he was shot, and uh, he finished the speech before he went and uh, received treatment. If you take a look at some of the other things going on at this time, uh, 1910, you're, you're now roughly half a century since the end of the Civil War. And so the NAACP is formed uh, to fight for and, and advance the uh, social causes of African Americans uh, in this country. 1912, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who takes America into World War I, we'll get to that a little bit later. And, and of course, everybody knows about the, the sinking of the Titanic 
1912, the ship that couldn't be sunk. Moving along here, uh, again, literary things up at the top. We're going to be reading some Robert Frost in this unit. Uh, he's sometimes called America's Poet. We'll be taking a look at a poem by T.S. Eliot. We will be reading, let's see, Wallace Stevens. Yeah, we'll be reading some Wallace Stevens poetry in this unit. Wallace Stevens was uh, from Reading, Pennsylvania. Yeah, so we get a little local color in this one. We'll be doing some William Carlos Williams. Uh, there's some more T.S. Eliot. Um, let's see, what else? Anything else up there that we'll be reading? We've got some William Carlos Williams over here as well. So we're not going to worry about those pieces of literature now because they're part of this unit. Uh, but again, going on in this, is this time period, uh, 1914, World War I begins, but it's not going to involve the United States for, for a while. The United States at this time period was pretty much isolationist, uh, believed that we were in our own part of the world and we had our own issues to work on. And World War I was essentially a European problem at that point. Uh, 1914 in Europe, you, uh, you have Mahatma Gandhi uh, returning to India and he's going to begin that nonviolent protest to get India's independence from Great Britain. We talked about that from a literary standpoint. You might remember we talked about how Gandhi had read on the duty of civil disobedience, which was written by Henry David Thoreau, who we read way back in our New England Renaissance unit. Uh, 1916, Wilson gets reelected. I said he's going to take America into World War I. And in 1917, the United States declares war on Germany, who has been using its, uh, its U-boats to attack uh, ships, including United States ships. Same year, the uh, Bolsheviks, the, the more radical of the two Russian revolutionary groups, the Mensheviks were a little bit more moderate, uh, get the revolution started. They uh, capture and eventually execute Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family uh, and set up uh, the world's first really large communist country. That is going to scare a lot of Americans uh, it's gonna make them afraid of socialism in some ways. And that becomes really important when we get to the depression and economics are so bad that people believe that socialism might be the solution. Unfortunately, a lot of people confuse socialism with communism. They're not the same thing. We'll talk about that when we get there. The United States enters the war in, in 1917. By 1918, the armistice is signed. That means that fighting stops, but troops stay in position until 1919 when the peace conference uh, is signed and the American troops come home. And what do they come home to find? Do they get to come home and party? No, they get to come home and find out that while they were away, prohibition passed and now alcohol is illegal for consumption in the United States. No way to celebrate there. One of the things that is not on here, could go back to 1918, would be the great flu pandemic. And since we're doing this video right now uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think there's a little bit of a, a connection there. We're looking at uh, 101 years, 102 years, I guess, uh, later. All right, we can skip everything else that's there. All right, again, literary events. We're going to be reading William Faulkner in this course. We'll be talking today a little bit about Gertrude Stein, and we'll talk about her again when we get to Hemingway, their relationship. We will not be reading any Virginia Woolf, but I really recommend you try some Virginia Woolf someday. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, right? That's a famous play. I did not make that up. Catherine Ann Porter, we're going to be reading a short story by her. We'll be taking a look at a short story by Ernest Hemingway, and of course, you will be reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's most famous novel, The Great Gatsby. Tender as the Night is okay, but The Great Gatsby is the great novel. All right, uh, other things that are going on by 1929, end of the jazz age, everything's been going great, economic, you know, kind of like uh, uh, flowering of every business possibility, uh, everything's good. And then the stock market collapses and we begin the Great Depression uh, in 1929. Herbert Hoover uh, had been elected president during that time, and he's going to get blamed for a lot of what doesn't happen during the Great Depression. Uh, Hitler comes to power, and uh, just a year before Roosevelt got elected, he's going to be America's only president elected to four terms. No other president served more than two terms. 
Uh, they all stopped running after that. But Roosevelt's going to serve four in the middle of World War II uh, and the Depression. Uh, and then while he's president, he's actually the, the president uh, who signs off uh, on the amendment that now limits uh, the president to, it, this is interesting, the president could actually be president for 10 years. So the limit is two terms or a maximum of 10 years. Well, two terms is eight years. So the only way someone could get 10 years is if, for instance, uh, you filled in, maybe, maybe you were vice president, the president dies, and you serve the final two years of that president's term, you may still serve two terms, which would be eight more, which would give you a total of 10. But 10 years is the maximum, two terms is, is probably what's more likely. By 1934, prohibition ends, and people are able to begin that you know, consumption of alcohol in this country again, and maybe they needed it because by 1936, uh, we are in another world war. World War I was nicknamed the war to end all wars, and here comes World War II, a bit of irony in that. And of course, World War II ends in, in 1945. So let's take a look at some of the, the big changes that happened during this 1900 to 1945 period. Change is going to be probably the most central theme uh, to everything we look at in this unit. And one of these ideas, uh, and, and, and this might come from William Faulkner, but is this idea of the world is changing, but what it means to be human is still the same thing. So, you know, things like caring, bravery, honesty, standing up for what's right, uh, family and family relationships, these things are going to stay the same, even though the world around us may be racing and changing almost every day. And that's one of the things we'll see in the literature of this time, is how the human aspects remain constant, uh, but the humans may not always understand the world that they're in at that time. Electricity is gonna change things. This uh, background shot that I have here, New York City, uh, with, with all of the lights and things like that, it's almost impossible for me to imagine what New York City must have been like in the days when it got dark and there was nothing but gas lamps and, and candles and oil lamps and things like that at night. But electric lights, uh, think about this, it's now going to be possible to have working shifts that run 24 hours a day, day and night, day and night, day and night. Uh, you're going to be able to work all day and, and go out and have dinner and see shows and things like that in the evening. So life is really going to change in the cities. Uh, there's that old song about New York, the city that never sleeps. And uh, part of that is because of electric lights. We're going to have a lot of changes in, in the way people shop and buy and get advertised to. So we're going to move into a period of time where the big companies are mass merchandising. You're going to see billboards all over the place. You're going to see ads in newspapers and magazines. You're going to go to the movies and you're going to see commercials as part of the movies. You're going to listen to the radio. You're going to hear commercials, the sponsors for the shows that you're listening to. And this is really going to change, you know, when, when people just get bombarded by advertising, it changes their behaviors. And I mentioned radio, a television even comes along during this time period. So radio early part, a radio is still around today and uh, television is going to come. They watched on those little tiny black and white screens and, and you've got in the early days, you've got just a few, hour, few hours of, of programming each day. Nothing streamed on the internet. There was no Netflix. Uh, and, and if you got one channel, you were lucky when television first got started. The population is going to change too. And I don't mean that the population is going to grow. That's been happening since the founding days of America but people are going to move back into the cities. That's where the jobs are going to be. And immigrants are going to be coming to this country and going into the cities. So the population in the cities is going to go up. The kind of work that they do is going to be uh, more menial, more uh, labor intensive kinds of things, uh, except for things like the banks and, and uh, you know, uh, the advertising agencies and things like that, which are in the cities as well but we're gonna have a change in, in what's actually happening in the cities. And you're gonna to start to see those skyscrapers in this time period. Uh, the Chrysler building is going to be built uh, to become the world's tallest building. But before that even happens, it's going to get surpassed by the Empire State Building, which for many years remains the world's longest, uh, tallest building rather. Uh, in this time period, you have automobiles 
they get invented. Uh, you, you, you finally have Henry Ford come along with the Model T, uh, the first automobile that's, uh, Henry Ford wanted it to be available to everybody who wanted a car. He wanted his own workers to be able to buy one and drive one. And so uh, it was very affordable, didn't have a whole lot of options. If you look at the cars down here in the picture, uh, they're all the same color. Henry Ford used to say you can have a Model T in any color you want, as long as it's black. Uh, and then airplanes come along in this time. So we have the, the Wright brothers testing planes to the point where we have, uh, we have uh, commercial airlines carrying people. And they're, they're not like today's 747 jumbo jets. They were prop planes, but they could easily take you know, 30 to 50 people uh, from one airport to the next. So uh, suddenly the world becomes smaller. You can hear live on the radio something that's going on thousands of miles away. Uh, used to be, you know, you could walk or ride a horse and only get so far in a day. Now you can fly uh, almost all the way across the country uh, in that same period of time. Medical advances are coming along during this time. And probably one of the biggest, most important medical advances during this time is going to be uh, the, in, the invention or the discovery of certain antibiotics. You know, up until this point, World War I and before that, most people died of disease, not by war injuries. Uh, during that time. Uh, by the time World War II comes along, we have antibiotics, uh, and you also have some vaccines coming along at this time too. Uh, and I already said architecture. You know, architecture now is going to take on more modernistic uh, designs like Art Deco or Art Nouveau, but the big thing is buildings are going to go up. We're going to learn how to use steel structures. See, when you build buildings just out of stone, you could only go so high because the upper part of the building became so heavy, it would literally crush the lower part of the building. Once we go with steel and using engineering to design the frames for buildings, the stone now becomes a facade. It's not, it's not what holds the building up. And so uh, you know, as, they, as engineers work, they go higher and higher and higher. And it almost becomes you know, like a symbol of American pride. How high can we shove these buildings into the sky? Uh, ideologies are going to change during this time period, and, and not always in a positive kind of way. So one of the things that is going to happen is you're going to have those soldiers coming back from World War I. They see the Jazz Age, and then everything collapses. And next thing you know, it's the Great Depression. And, and the wealthiest people, guys like Rockefeller and Carnegie, they have wealth beyond belief, while the average working man may be waiting in a bread line hoping for handouts to feed his family. And so there's gonna be this question of, does the American dream still exist? You know, going back to Benjamin Franklin, these ideas, if, if you work hard, you can achieve anything in America. And, and now some of these writers who fought in the war and came back and see that their country has nothing for them, start to question, is the American dream dead? All right, the first world war came along. I, I said it was 1914. Uh, it is unlike anything Americans have ever seen before. So I think I mentioned to you during our Civil War unit, during the entire Civil War, if we counted deaths of soldiers and civilians, we don't get to a million. And that's over a four year war of Americans fighting Americans. In World War I, at a single battle, called the Battle of the Somme. It was a 30-day, well, I shouldn't say 30-day. It was approximately a one-month battle. They had a million casualties in that single battle because you have all these countries in Europe, uh, their alliances failed and, and they're just fighting one another. Uh, it was devastating. And it goes on for three years before the United States enters the war. We already talked about Gandhi coming back to India. Uh, that's going to lead to uh, more turmoil because you know uh, Queen Victoria of Great Britain was the Empress of India. It wasn't even her country, and the Indian people are going to use nonviolent strategies uh, to win the support of the world and get their country back so they can rule it themselves. I already told you, United States enters in 1917, and by 1919 uh, we're going to have a treaty. The same year that the United States enters World War One the communist revolution in uh, Russia, what's going to become ultimately the Soviet Union gets started. Uh, 1919 is the Treaty of Versailles, as I said, that officially brings to an end World War I. Uh, 
And, and as part of this, since the United States had to go into World War I, it's gonna be the end of isolationism. And that's gonna change things in the United States as well. Americans no longer see that we are in our own country and we will take care of ourselves. Americans now realize it is absolutely necessary that we as citizens of the United States also become citizens of the world and that the United States has a role to play. And some of that started with things like the League of Nations and, and then ultimately uh, the United Nations. And another thing that's gonna happen during this time as far as literature goes is the end of regionalism. So we talked about when we did our, uh, when we did our frontiers unit, we talked about the popularity uh, people in New York City might wanna read a story that is set in Alaska or people in Philadelphia might wanna read a story that is set in the wilderness of Maine. Uh, that's called regionalism. But by this point, Americans aren't seeing themselves anymore as, as living in these little pockets of America. They're starting to see themselves as Americans. So as the United States sort of blows up on the world uh, front, these little kind of tiny communities begin to see themselves as, as part of something bigger as well. So uh, as far as literature goes, it's gonna kind of be the end of regionalism in this time period. Now, uh, there's this group called the Lost Generation. There's Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway used to go on these safaris and shoot all kinds of beautiful big game in, in Africa and things like that. That's a lion that he shot. Uh, anyway, he was part of a group of writers who believed they just didn't fit in anymore. They participated in World War I. Uh, they, they believe that America is not fulfilling the promise that it, it, it once had for them. And uh, there's, there's another writer, uh, a poet, I mentioned her name earlier, called uh, Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein. And, and she wrote at one point that they're all part of a lost generation. They don't fit, they don't belong here anymore. Um, and so these are some of the writers that we're going to be reading. They, they don't take an outwardly, like, they don't write things that intentionally make you feel down. They write things that are realistic. Sometimes bad things happen, and it's up to you as the reader to assign good or bad to things. And so literature, you're not gonna be directed so much by the author anymore as far as what you're supposed to think, but you're supposed to figure out what you think based on what they share with you. And so uh, you'll, you'll see as we get into this literature and take a look at some things, this, this will be clear. Uh, we're looking at a period of time in the 1920s, which is often called the Roaring Twenties. Uh, economically, things are going great, but we've also got prohibition during this time. And so you start to see uh, sort of America's first really big uh, clash of uh, older and younger generations, a generation gap, you might call it. And uh, so younger people are going to break a lot of the rules of society, right? Not laws, but well, they will be drinking illegally and speakeasies and clubs and stuff like that. But they'll break some of the rules. For instance, women will start wearing more provocative clothing. They'll no longer have those big padded, you know, dresses with, you know, tons of undergarments. Uh, you may see the shape of their body. Uh, women may start asking men out on dates and things like that. And so some of the older folks, you know, they just struggle with these kinds of changes. Uh, I mentioned speakeasies. Speakeasies were sort of like secret illegal bars. So you'll see one in The Great Gatsby when, when we read that, but uh, you might go into a, uh, what looks like a library, people sitting around reading books and drinking coffee like a Starbucks. But if you go back to the door over there and knock three times, a little window opens and you can say, Joe sent me and they welcome you in and you find that in the back room, everybody's drinking alcohol illegally and it's just like being in a bar. Why don't the police shut them down? Because usually they paid them off, right? So just because alcohol was illegal did not mean people stopped drinking. Maybe some did, uh, but there was a lot of money to be made in making and selling alcohol illegally. All right, so what else do we have here during this time period? Jump down to the bottom here. Uh, New York City becomes uh, sort of a, uh, the center of a cultural revolution. Uh, in the lower part of Manhattan, you still have an artist community uh, called Greenwich Village. Writers are going to live in there. They're gonna write uh, almost hippie-like for that time period, not like the 60s, uh, but they're what we call bohemians. They live a free life, they try new things, they don't believe in, in following conventional uh, 
rules and things like that. And they form writers groups that support one another. And so when a writer tries something new, other writers give them feedback, they share ideas. And so you have this literary scene coming along here. All right, so then in 1929, you have the stock market crash. We talked about that. Karl Marx was a German philosopher uh, who wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto. And what Karl Marx says in this book is that when companies begin treating their labor badly, underpaying them, overworking them, not showing appreciation, that uh, sort of a, a revolution, an uprising or a rebellion is certain. And people started to believe in the 1930s during the depression that if we did not do something, there would be some kind of uprising. And some people, because of what happened in 1917 with the Bolshevik revolution, some people believed, oh my gosh, could the United States become the Soviet Union? And so there was a scare, uh, sometimes called a red scare, where people were afraid uh, that communism might be able to get a foothold in the United States. Now we do at this time, we do have some of, uh, some of the wealthiest people. Everybody knows the names, Carnegie, JP Morgan, Rockefeller. Uh, these are among the richest people on the entire planet during this time. And yet at the same time, we have some of the poorest people living in the United States. So we have a, a giant wealth gap and that's never good. And so during that time, uh, some, there are some revolutionaries get started. Anarchists are people who believe we need to do away with the government as it is, just start all over kind of thing. And so there were uh, terroristic bombings and things like that throughout the United States. President Roosevelt promised everyone what he called a new deal. We're going to restructure, people hate the term, the redistribution of wealth, but we're gonna restructure the way our economy works so that the money doesn't just flow into the hands of a few all the time. And so one of the things that comes during this time is social security. And what social security originally did was it provided income for people who become too old to continue to work. All workers pay in, there's a fund. And when people get to the point where they're too old to work, uh, they still are able to collect something so they can live a, a better life. Social security has changed over the years. And so what we have today is a little different from what it got started with. Welfare programs, it, when people are out of work and they have children. I mean, there was a time in this country where all you could do was beg on the streets and hope somebody would hand you food. Now we've got programs that will provide food for you. We've got some federally funded jobs during this time period. If you've ever driven up on Mount Penn in Reading to the Pagoda, uh, you go up Skyline Drive with a stone wall. up That whole road and, and that wall, uh, they were built by workers during the Depression with federal monies, got paid to build roads and things. Uh, people worked in national parks during that time. So when people were out of work, we said, all right, what does this country need? And we had jobs that were paid by the federal government. Uh, so people actually made their country better. They didn't just sit home and collect money. Uh, the government got something back in, in return for some of the monies that were, they were paying out. And then you have during the same time period to make things even worse, uh, middle America had been uh, sort of like not taking care of its land, just growing and harvesting and growing and harvesting, uh, killed some of the soil. It was no longer productive, uh, turned to dust, storms come in and you have what we call the dust bowl. And so people who owned farms uh, in, in this part of the country, and these farms have now become worthless. They pack up their families. They move to California, hoping to get jobs. They generally work as, as migrant workers on farms, picking fruits and vegetables and things like that. Uh, the Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck is probably the classic novel about this time period of the Dust Bowl. And of course, racism, racism uh, seems to go way back in America. Uh, during this time period where jobs become short, racism becomes a bigger problem. Because if you have people in uh, different cultures that are also kind of like tied to economic groups, poorer people are willing to do a job for less money because even though it's less than what somebody else might be getting, it's still more than what I'm getting right now. And the people who had those jobs started to fear that their jobs would be taken away by people who would do them for less. And sometimes that comes in the form of, of racism. All right, uh, another group of writers during this time was known as the expatriates. 
So what the expatriates are, they're a group of writers who believed that America no longer held that American dream for them. So they literally packed up and they went off to Europe. For the most part, they went off to Paris and they hung out and they wrote and they partied and they had a really good time. Uh, and everybody back in America was reading all their, their really good stuff. Um, they believed that they were writing better stuff than Americans wanted. In other words, they were creating art and a lot of Americans just wanted to read a cheap dime store Western or something like that. And so they thought if Americans have no taste for good culture, we'll go off to Europe where they appreciate high culture kind of thing. And, and this is where modernism is gonna kind of take hold and, and then come back to the US. Now that's a Picasso, that image that I have there is a, a Pablo Picasso. And Picasso uh, painted in a modernist style which is sometimes called cubism. It's interesting. Uh, if you look at that picture, what you're really seeing is you're seeing the face of, of a woman, but you're seeing it from several angles all at the same time. That's why the eyes are kind of like so crooked like that and the nose is in, in sort of an odd place. You're seeing it from the front at the same time you're seeing it from the side and perhaps from even above a little bit. And, and this is just a new interpretation of art of let, what if we could see something from many sides all at the same time. So this modernistic uh, movement is, is going to involve a rejection of the kind of traditional art that we've known before. It's going to become international. It's gonna happen in Europe, the United States, South America. Uh, in literature, we're gonna have new techniques. Well, they're, they're not completely new, but free verse. So when we talked about Walt Whitman, we talked about how Walt Whitman wrote in free verse and he took criticism because that's not poetry. And Emerson said, oh, this guy's got something going here. Let's just watch what he does. By the time we get into this modern era, free verse is going to be the way to write poetry. And, and that has stayed true till today. Uh, most of, most of the, the great poetry we have written uh, you know, in the last 50 years tends to be free verse. Another style comes along called stream of consciousness. And, and what happens in stream of consciousness is if we have a narrator or a protagonist that is, is thinking, we hear every thought every thought, even if one thought interrupts another thought, as happens with real human beings, that's what we get. It, it's, it's just this ongoing stream. And it leaves a lot up to the reader to determine what is most important. Some of the words that you can use to describe art and literature during this time, uh, it can feel alienating, like I don't belong. Uh, it can be understated. In other words, there might be a very serious message, but it's not obvious. There's something very subtle in the way the message comes through to you. There's a lot of irony, but art has always been full of irony. And, and, and it's impersonal. This might come out of the idea of American realism again. That bad things happen. It's not your fault. You know, it might be, but, but bad things happen to good people. And it's just the way it is. Don't take it personally. Uh, there's this idea of, of taking old ideas and refreshing them making them new, and there's sometimes this sense of hopelessness. I mean, the depression wasn't exactly a time of, of great optimism. All right, there's Robert Frost, a very young Robert Frost, probably a, America's most loved poet ever. We're gonna have a couple literary movements during this time period as well. So there are the post-war regionalists, a few regionalists still hang on there. One of them, of, uh, of course, um, is, is going to be writing about Alaska and, and we've read his stuff already. Uh, then you have the fugitive movement and that's gonna be William Faulkner who, who believes that with all this movement into the cities, Americans are starting to lose what they're about. And so we should do stories about families in the South because it's still agrarian and they still hold true to those ideals that never change. We're gonna have a new way of looking at literature called new criticism. So before new criticism, uh, people generally looked at an author and a time period and, and what the piece said. Now they're gonna be looking for symbols. They're gonna be looking for formulas. They're going to be, they, they believe basically that every piece of literature has a hidden meaning that you can interpret and discover. And then Harlem, Harlem is in New York City. We're gonna have something called the Harlem Renaissance, bringing new life back to Harlem. Harlem uh, in New York City, even back then, was largely an African-American community. And we're going to have all kinds of art. We're gonna have music, uh, mostly jazz, but we're gonna have music and the blues. We're going to have uh, paintings, sculptures, 
We're going to have plays. We're going to have short stories. We're going to have novels all coming out of, of that African-American community in Harlem during this time. All right. So let's do the check for understanding questions here. I don't like many of these questions. Different units in our textbook were obviously written by different people because the styles are so different, uh, but we'll talk about them here. So number one, which concept most closely defined American society in the first half of the 20th century? 20th century, uh, melancholy, adventure, progress, or colonialism. And I think you could make an argument for more than one of these. But progress, and, and I probably would have said change, because sometimes it feels like not all change is progress. But we're going to go, like I showed you, from candles to electric lights, from horses to cars to planes, from two-story buildings to 50-story buildings. And that's going to affect uh, everything we look at in this unit. What idea prompted by Benjamin Franklin was challenged by the writers of the early 20th century? And that's going to be the idea of the American dream. World War I is going to change people's outlooks. You, you come back from this horrible time and you find that America is not fulfilling its promises to you. How about this one? A primary conflict during the Jazz Age was between what groups of people? Well, we said it was a generation gap, so it's going to be older people and younger people. With this one, in the midst of the Great Depression, some thought America was moving towards what? Social revolt. People believe that you can't have half the country begging for food and not have some kind of social revolt when you have people like the Carnegies and, and, and the Rockefellers living in giant mansions with everything they could possibly want. There we go. Uh, the most significant regional literary movement was the what movement, led by writers who rejected urban commercial values for a return to the land and the American traditions that could be found in the South. We just talked about this one, and that's going to be the fugitive movement. It takes its name from a magazine. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a dumb title for that movement. It's not like you're a fugitive from justice or anything like that. Number two, what was a response to, to the perceived breakdown of American culture? We don't even need to go on there. A response to the perceived breakdown of American culture. And that's modernism, right? Modernism was, oh, let's try it in a different way kind of uh, art form. We mentioned Gertrude Stein, we're not gonna read her, but she's important because she gave a name to that, uh, that group of writers who left the country. They were expatriates, but she called them the lost generation. You are all a lost generation, she said. Number four, what sought to present single moments of sense perception without reference to the emotions or opinions of the author, narrator, or speaker? Now I alluded to this earlier, but I didn't give you the term. Uh, in poetry, it's called imagist poetry. You see the images, all right, but you need to decide what they mean. What are the emotions? What should I take away from this? It's not explained for you. And number five, what was characterized by a rejection of the artistic convex, conventions of the past? And that's going to be a reuse of modernism again, right? What, was, what viewed reality not as absolute, but depending upon perspective? That word perspective is the key. And it's going to be subjectivists. Again, they give you subjectivist. Uh, you got to make it a plural here so it works. I did not mention Dorothy Parker, but Dorothy Parker was one of those writers uh, down in Greenwich Village. And she formed a group of other writers in that artsy community. And they called themselves the Algonquin Roundtable. Uh, I don't think I'm ever going to ask you that question again. So don't worry about it. Irony became a defining element of what kind of literature, indicating a retreat from society into a pure literary uh, view, and that's going to be modernist literature. That's always a good guess in this unit when you don't know the answer, because modernist literature, uh, there are so many different aspects to it that we can describe it in a lot of different ways. You can't quite pin it down. You know it when you see it, but you can't quite define it. Uh, number four, Gertrude Stein, we've had her before. Uh, she called them the lost generation. And number five, uh, what examined literature through close readings and attention to formal patterns and meanings. So this is a way of analyzing literature, not writing it. They gave you new critic, but you've got to put new criticism 
The United States delayed entering World War I mostly because it didn't consider the war to be an American problem. That is true. Number two, the growth of manufacturing and vast migration of people to urban centers led to an increased sense of freedom and self-reliance among Americans. That's actually false. Uh, when people moved into that city, they felt that they, they were now becoming worker bees and, and had less freedom and less choice. Number three, as an attempt to help children of all religions acquire education, prohibition banned prayer in public schools, and that's false. Prohibition banned the consumption of alcohol in this country. Uh, number four, Karl Marx wrote, a, wrote that a society that abused its labor force would face result, and that is true. That was part of the fear uh, during the Great Depression that Marxism, uh, they used to call it Marxism, today we call it communism, uh, would come to the United States. And number five, many American advocates of socialism changed their views after they learned of the brutal actions of Stalin and Hitler. And again, I would rewrite this question. Uh, yes, they learned about the brutal actions of Stalin who was a dictator in a socialist country. People often put Hitler in with socialism because his party was called the Socialist Party, but there was nothing socialist about the Nazi party. Socialism is something completely different. Uh, we don't need to get into that right now. Ask your social studies teacher about that one. And so that one's gonna be true as well. All right, I know that was a lot, but there's a lot packed into this unit. And you can always come back and, and watch the video again, uh, and again and again, you know, cancel your Netflix account, just watch me. Um, anyway, we're gonna get started with the unit. And uh, I, I think you're gonna like the modernist unit, especially Gatsby. I find that uh, I would say about 90% of my students absolutely love the great Gatsby. And the 10% who say they don't like it, didn't really read it. They sort of try to fake their way through it and they never make a connection with it. It truly is one of America's greatest novels. And I think you're gonna like this unit. So I'll see you soon.